That's why I suspect there's a bunch of families not here today that don't come to our specialty services because I have too much fun and they're too spiritual for. And then the, and then the other part can't handle it when I start speaking truths about their team. And I'm not calling any teams by name today. I'm not going to praise any teams that blew out their opponent yesterday. And I'm not going to have any negative things to say about teams who went down in embarrassing ways yesterday. You know who you are. <laughs> and we'll just leave it right there. Suffice it to say, I went to bed really surprised about nothing that happened yesterday. It all played out exactly, not only as I expected, but as I hoped and prayed for when I pulled the calendar out and said, now what would be a good Sunday for team day? What's the most likely chances to have us on a day where my team wins and all their teams lose? And I want you to know, I want you to know, no matter what your opinion is of me, God has proved that He smiles on this past day. Oh, it's all in good fun, isn't it? Like I tried to tell one of the people who was harassing me via texting last night, I've noticed that people harass me more texting though when West Virginia is losing than when after we win. And when their team's going down, suddenly I start texting them back and they just don't want to talk to me. <laughs> but as I was telling one sister, who's not here today, but we will be listening to this later on via internet, when the dust clears, it don't mean a thing, does it? Because the kingdom still stands even when our teams fall. And ain't nothing that's really important been lost when a game is lost, right? But there's something to learn from it all. Would you agree with that? Okay. Sorry we couldn't do our tailgate party out there the way that we should have today. A bunch of city folks were all in here inside with your biscuits and everything. But uh, I got tired of hanging out out there by myself. But the bratwurst were really good that I cooked on my grill out there early this morning. Of course, I was out there earlier before you guys because a bunch of city people slept in, I guess. <laughs> and the visitors are saying, man, is this, is this guy serious? I'm serious starting right now. Alright, look at this familiar passage of Scripture that many of you have read many times from Acts chapter 2. It says, they, and speaking of the first century church, those who had begun to follow Christ, believe upon Him from that day of, on Pentecost in that upper room from the 120, it began to mushroom. And it began to grow. Hundreds to thousands were being added daily and weekly to the gathering. It's speaking of those people, the church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. And selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, yesterday was, was a little different picture for Mountaineer Nation. Um, we played an opponent that actually wasn't as bad as they ended up looking. Actually, they were probably one of the stronger mid-level schools in the country. Um, it just so happened that yesterday, we finally started clicking a little bit in Morgantown. Uh, not so much the week before, though things did start clicking a little bit. And so how many of you guys watched the big uh, WVU-LSU game last Saturday night? Um, along with uh, four point or four something, right at four million other people in the country on TV, packed out stadium. Um, ESPN's game day was there. It was a, a glorious, glorious day for most of the day in West Virginia. And there was a lot of good things that happened that game, though. I, I told Jackie when the game was over, I said, I'm actually very optimistic and encouraged because we finally started doing some things we had not done all year, and the only thing that killed us. Um, with some really stupid mistakes. And so, as I listened to Coach Holverson uh, being interviewed through the course of the rest of the week, he said exactly what I was expecting him to say. He said, you know, we've got a very talented football team. It's a little young, but we've got a lot of talent. He said, our problem is we just don't have the fundamentals down. And all they talked about was fundamentals, fundamentals. And what he was saying was, in some examples he used, was that it doesn't matter how fast you run down the field when there's a punt or a kickoff, 
It doesn't matter how fast your defenders run down there and get to the guy with the ball. If they don't know how to grab him, wrap him up and tackle him, what's the point? And so he was saying, you know, tackling is just a fundamental of football. Not running to somebody and getting to where they're at. He said grabbing them, wrapping them up and tackling them. He said that's just a basic fundamental of football. He talked about some other things like protecting the ball. He said, you know, these guys know before you even tell them time and time and time again that when they have the ball, they have to hold on to the ball. They have to protect the ball. They can't just stick the ball out there anywhere they want and take off running because guys are going to be trying to tackle them. He said, that's just a basic fundamental of football, protecting the ball, tackling, blocking the guy in front of you. He said, it's just fundamentals. And he said, if you get the fundamentals down, he said, you'll win a bunch of games. He said, I'm not worried about our talent. I'm worried about our fundamentals. And so they're working on fundamentals now. And yesterday, it appeared they were a little more fundamentally sound than they had been all season long. <coughs> I love the story of John Wooden. I mean, you guys know who I'm talking about. The great UCLA coach for, for many, many years. Greatest coach as far as winning percentage that's ever existed in any sport on any level throughout the history of this nation. John Wooden passed away last year in June, 99 years old, and quite a legacy was buried with him. John Wooden won 10 national championships at UCLA. 10. That's a lot in case you don't know much about college sports or any other kind of sports. That's a lot. 10 national championships. At one point, they had strung together 37 straight playoff wins. I'm talking about postseason, where you get into the playoffs and you go all the way to the end and you win, and the next season you're in the playoffs again and you go all the way to the end and you win again. 37 straight tournament victories. He had four teams that went 30 and 0. Do you understand how difficult that is in college basketball? At one point, they had put together 88 consecutive wins. That's, that's incredible. And I understand that if you're really not into sports a lot, some of these statistics may not really resonate in you, but if you are into sports at all, you understand how incredible these statistics are. John Wooden was set apart in many ways, but the primary way he was set apart as a coach was that he never, never, never scouted opposing teams before playing them. Next week, West Virginia plays UConn. So this week, um, coaches have already been looking at a lot of, a lot of tape, a lot of games that UConn has played. They're, they're looking at their offense, their defense. They're trying to figure out where's their backs, how do they run, how's the quarterback <laughs> operating here, um, how's their, 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 their defense schemes. You know, they're looking at that and they're going to pass that on to the players. They're saying, look at this, how they're doing. They have scouted a team before they play them and they show them tape, video, so they can prepare for it. It's common in college sports. It would be incredibly, incredibly, incredibly rare for any college coach on any level, whether it be football or basketball, not to scout their opposition in order to prepare for them. John Wooden never one single time ever scouted a team before UCLA played them. In fact, John Wooden only preached one thing to his team. Fundamentals. It's all they ever worked on. They worked on dribbling. They worked on passing. They worked on the correct way to shoot foul shots. Your basics. The basics of basketball. Because he said, you know, we started winning here at UCLA and he said, we get good quality players. He said, we get skill. He said, we've got skill packages. He said, skill is not what wins championships. He said, sound, fundamental teams win championships. And we've watched that. We've seen that. I, I, I've watched all kinds of sports for many years of my life. I used to really be into the NBA, professional basketball. And I was the most avid Chicago Bulls fan you could ever imagine. That's the last thing I've got left up there is that old Afghan. And I had to ask my wife, do I still have that Bulls Afghan laying around? So I dusted it off and brought it down here. I used to have all the paraphernalia and, the, and, and all the clothes. And it's just like, and I lost interest there. 
once you get a certain percentage of thugs in a sport, I start losing interest, which is why I have no interest in, in the NFL. I have no interest in professional football as much of a Bears fan as I used to be. I love, I love college sports because most classy coaches do not allow thugness on their teams. Uh, I've watched many, many years as teams that were preseason picked to do very, very well ended up not doing well at all. They were preseason favorites because of their talent, man. Just loaded down with talent. They had five-star recruits and four-star recruits. And, and everybody said with, with that kind of recruiting, they're going to win Buku championships. And in fact, those teams often would struggle and struggle and struggle. And then there would be teams who who didn't seem to have that much talent, but they would go so far. People have been surprised, actually, speaking of West Virginia, that, that in college basketball, in the Big East Conference, which is the strongest basketball conference in college sports, that West Virginia, the last few years, has done so well. I mean, we always end up in the playoffs and always end up at least in the Sweet 16, a lot of times the Elite Eight, and a couple years ago in the Final Four. Knocked off Kentucky, not that I'm trying to stir anything up here today. But our recruiting, our recruiting classes were nothing compared to what Kentucky would recruit. Or UConn, or Syracuse, all kinds of teams like that. North Carolina, Duke. Those teams, perennial powers, recruit all the stars. And it just so happens our last two coaches, and this one especially, preaches something that has been lost in the art of basketball. It's fundamentals. It's fundamentals. It's fundamentals. John Wooden was our case in point that life is not about ability. It's not about talent. It's not about those things you try to muster up at the last minute. It's about attaining sound fundamentals in life. This story we just read in Acts is a story of fundamentals. It's a story that if we take 2,000 years ago what was going on in the first century church and we mirror it against the church today, we would see quite a contrast. We would see a first century church preaching sound fundamentals. They were saying you've got to have a solid prayer life. You, you've got to have that time where you get alone with God and you have this commune time with God in prayer. There were a church who understood we have got to get ourselves in a place routinely where we're hearing the Word of God being taught. They were devoting themselves to worship. And they were devoting themselves to a fourth component that wouldn't look all that supernatural to the untrained eye. Simple, basic fellowship. That's the four things they were doing. Fundamentals. They were praying. They were in the Word, specifically in this context, with the apostles teaching, because you've got to remember they did not have Bibles. Not even the King James back then, despite what some people think. <laughs> They were worshiping and they were fellowshipping together in each other's homes, literally sharing meals, communion time together as families and friends. Because they were so fundamentally sound, they saw incredible evangelism. They saw incredible miracles. And Luke, the writer of Acts, said that the whole city of Jerusalem was filled with joy and was awestruck by what they were witnessing in this thing called the church. But all they were doing was adhering to fundamentals. There was nothing flashy going on. There was no special hybrid sermons being preached. If we mirror that against a more modern day church, we see that Rather than focusing on fundamentals, we have a church in America, especially that has put more emphasis on things like, like, like altar services. Where we will preach something to the people and we'll say, um, 
I know you've got this problem and that problem and, and you have no peace and you have no joy and you're needing a miracle and you're needing this fixed and that fixed and we know your life is a wreck, but if you'll come up here today to this altar, we're going to pray with you and lay hands on you and your life is going to change today. And while there are some incredible things that can happen around an altar, there is no doubt. We've done a little swapping through the ages. And we have traded sound fundamentals in serving God with flash in the pan experiences that are supposed to transform somebody's life. You see, we took the instantaneous physical healings of the Bible and we set that up as a filter to process every single human need through. And because Jesus miraculously healed broken bodies on the spot, somehow we equate that to broken lives being healed in a moment, in a second, on the spot, even though the Bible really doesn't have any of those stories. We write books. We hold special conferences. I grew up in churches, and please, please always be able to hear the, the full picture of, of what I'm trying to say. When I take things from the past and say, we've got to rip this thing out, we've got to throw this thing out of the body of Christ, I'm by no means ever saying we've got to throw the baby out with the bathwater. From glory to glory, He is changing us. And if it wasn't for the things that happened in the last generation, we wouldn't be where we're at today in the body of Christ. But we have to be wise and we have to look at our situations and we have to say, was this working or was it not working? And the whole problem was we were trying things to see if it would work. When I push this button, God does this. When I don't push this button, God does this or does not do this. We went from being a church who was birthed out of sound fundamentals to a church that tries to live in a microwave. From glory to glory, He's trying to change us, but we're living our lives from problem to problem. Thing to thing that needs to be fixed in our life. Crisis to crisis, tragedy to tragedy, woe is me to woe is me. And we find that instead of becoming a church that experienced the fruit of the first century church, we find ourselves struggling just to maintain life maintenance. And that's what church has become all about now. Maintaining our lives. The first century church never preached miracles, but they had tons of miracles. You couldn't sling a dead cat in Jerusalem without hitting someone right in the head. It was just getting a miracle. Miracles here and miracles there. And Incredible things. Whatever Jesus was doing, He was right. He said, you're going to do more than me. And the apostles are out there and there's signs and wonders floating around everywhere. But nobody was preaching signs and wonders. Nobody was teaching miracles. So how did they get so many miracles? We bring that to the venue of a modern day church. And we hold special conferences and we write special books and it's about the supernatural. It's about how to get the supernatural. And it's about how to get miracles and how to attain miracles and how to, how to, how to cause miracles. And we search high and we search low to find the, just anything we can put our hands on and tweak and use our poetic license now to present in a testimony. It's like, oh, let me tell you about this great miracle, man. I just was so sick. I had a head cold, man, and they prayed for me at church. And I mean, three days later, it was true. But on the third day, man, I came out of the grave and I was like, new again. Yeah, it's a miracle that you got over a cold in three days. Most of the testimonies I hear about miracles are pieces of testimony. And actually, what I hear a lot are, are, are legitimate testimonies of healing. Healings that are taking place in process over time. Which are also very important that we do not get our eyes off that. Healings is a plural term, the way Paul uses it. There's all kinds of healings. And we don't know how to separate healings from miracles anymore. Miracles, bam, on the spot. Healings, something that begins to take place over a process of time. And I am by no means trying to belittle when people share testimonies uh, of a situation in their life that's an incomplete picture yet, but it has begun. But we begin to present that thing bigger than life because it's all we've got. In the first century church, they never taught on healing, and they saw lots of healings. The 20th century church probably preached on healing more than any single topic. 
There's probably been more specialty church services in the 20th century that revolve around healing than any single topic. Yeah, we struggle trying to figure out, is, is this thing really happening? Why is, it, why is it not happening the way the Bible testifies that it did? And we should be able to put does on there. They weren't even preaching it. They were seeing it. We're preaching it and we're not seeing it. They're seeing signs and wonders, man. We're preaching signs and wonders, and why aren't we seeing signs and wonders? We travail in a modern day church trying to remember how to do effective evangelism. 20th century said, let's try something new here. Let's just scare the bejeebies out of people. We just need our stats. If we can get them up here, and then, then a couple clowns invented this thing we call the sinner's prayer because we wanted to put evangelism in a microwave just like we wanted to put um, healing the microwave. We want to we want to put that whole uh, that whole incredible life changing experience with God in this second in time. But we've got to get people to an altar, so we're going to scare the bejeebies out of them first, and then we know a lot of them are going to come up here. In fact, they'll keep coming up here every time we preach that sermon. And the more they come up here, the more we can pat our stats and really make this thing look good. And so little churches said, we had 300 people get saved this last year in our church. What they forgot to tell you was the same eight people over and over and over again. Because all you got to do is, 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 is preach two things in one sermon. Remind everybody what dirty, rotten sinners they are and they'll never be able to measure up and then tell them a good story about hell. And I promise you, the altar will be full all over again. I promise you. They weren't preaching on evangelism in the first century church. But the church was being added to daily. Peter preaches a 10 minute sermon. He gives an altar call. What was it? A couple thousand people come and they, and they say, I want to follow him. All the things we're trying to attain, we're trying to attain them by preaching them and having altar calls that revolve around them. And, and we're, we, we're, we've just we're millions of books in, in print that helps people get through the dilemmas of life, the problems of life, the conflicts of life, the, the adversaries of life that try to attack us. And, and, and churches revolve around trying to help people get through life, but nobody was preaching anything to try to help anyone get through life in the first century church. They were just preaching sound fundamentals. They were living sound fundamentals. They were practicing sound fundamentals. They had prayer lives. They were in the Word of God. They were worshipers. And they were actively involved in fellowship with the body of Christ. They were a church that was persecuted. You and I do not know what that word means. We read stories about it happening in other places, but you and I do not know what it means to be persecuted for our faith. Until someone strings you up, impales you on a stake, douses you in oil and sets you on fire, you don't know what it's like to be persecuted for your faith. Until someone puts you in chains and throws you into the arena with lions, you don't know what it's like to be persecuted for your faith. They were thrown to the lions. They were impaled on stakes. Jesus was not the only Jew to be crucified. Thousands were crucified. To tell you the truth, in Jerusalem, the day that Jesus died between two thieves, three people crucified, that was probably a slow day. You don't see anywhere on record their ministries of their churches begin to revolve around a just hold on attitude. Nobody was passing out left behind books. Nobody was saying, just keep your eyes on the eastern sky. We'll be out of here any second. Just, just close your eyes, grit and bear it. They were persecuted. Not only did they hold on, they spread throughout the earth. And the propagation of the gospel only increased because of it. We mirror that against the modern day church. and I dare not touch the list of reasons why we can't stay in a consistent walk with God because I don't want to really embarrass anybody now after comparing our modern day list with what was going on in the first century church. 
I hear woe is me stories all the time about people struggle to walk with God. And I sit there and I, and I, and I, and I try to be sympathetic and I, and I try to be a good pastor and I try to pet them and say, oh, come on, let's just pray. We can get you through it. And the reality is the things that hold us back really are quite insignificant in the big picture of history. How many were here Wednesday night? I realized when I left here Wednesday night that I probably taught one of the single most important lessons that I'd ever taught to this house about scale. And I realized if we could have only got that one lesson Wednesday night, if we could get that and put that in us and hold that in our spiritual tummies and digest that, I realized that our walk with God would so radically change. We, would, we wouldn't know ourselves or each other six months from now. We don't have proper scale for life. So we think that we're suffering for Jesus and we think we're being persecuted and we think it's so hard to walk with God. So I have to look at this picture in the first century church and I see what these people were going through. The price tag that was involved in walking with God and knowing Jesus and serving Him and being a disciple of Christ and being the church, meeting together in public places and the risk that was involved. But instead of Luke saying, and the people were hiding out in their basements, fearing for their life, wondering what have they got themselves into, Luke said, man, this thing began to spread. He said the whole city was in awe of what was going on. He said the whole city was filled with joy and they were amazed at what the disciples were doing. The supernatural wonders of God. I look at a first century church that had sound fundamentals. And I compare it to a modern day church who operates in a microwave type mentality that honestly believes that the equipping to walk with God takes place in a second at an altar or the reading of a book or the attending of the next conference. First century church prayed. They adhered to the teaching of the apostles. They fellowshiped and they worshiped. The result was great evangelism, great miracles, great joy, and great endurance through true suffering and persecution. They endured the persecution because the fundamentals preceded the persecution. They enjoyed great signs, wonders, miracles because fundamentals preceded the miracles. The Bible is full of stories of people that that are just glimpses of the same church, this first century church. We see that there's an order of steps of God here that if you put this in your life first, you put this in place first, get these ducks in a row, then when you face this later on in life, the results will be completely different. I want you to know that long before David faced a giant, he was a worshiper. He did not wait till he faced the giant and said, oh my gosh, I better go to church and really worship this week to help get rid of this giant. And while we chuckle at that, because it's worth chuckling over, the reality is, I just very clearly painted the picture of a modern day church. What percentage of people in churches in America today are there because they fit into the category of everything's going great, so now I can serve God? And which percentage are there because say, my life is not going great, it's falling apart, so I better get back in church and let God fix this? You see, in America, we become a very reactive culture. We react. We wait for something to happen, then we react. It happens, we react. It happens, we react. We, if you were here last week, we are, we are classic operators of Newton's law. For every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. So we wait for something to happen, then we react. Something bad just happened, I better get in church. Something just happened, I better start praying. Something just happened, I, I better start worshiping. Something just happened, I better start going to church. Something just happened, I better start hanging out with the right crowd and fellowship and the first century church learned that those fundamentals preceded life. And if you precede life with the fundamentals of our faith, the outcome is incredibly different. David did not wait till he was hiding out in caves, running for his life to become a worshiper. David was a worshiper before he found his life in a musty cave. David was a worshiper before he was on the land. Because David had those fundamentals in place first, 
He conquered the giants. He overcame the cave. And he became a king of kings in the earth. How do you go from a shepherd boy to becoming a great king? Fundamentals. Fundamentals. Daniel did not wait till he was in the lion's den to become a prayer warrior. Daniel was a prayer warrior before he was thrown in the lion's den. Now, modern day American teaching would say if you're a prayer warrior, you'll never end up in the lion's den. I mean, I grew up in churches that kind of presented that philosophy. If you'll put these ducks in a row, nothing bad will happen. How many of you guys were here last week? I know last week flew in the face of a lot of modern day church philosophy. Not theology, but philosophy. But if we're here, you were reminded that no, bad things happen to good people all the time, just like good things happen to bad people all the time. Daniel was doing nothing wrong. He was only doing a lot of good things. He ended up in the lion's den. He made it through the lion's den. He come out of the lion's den with a king saying, not only is Daniel is God, his God, I think we need to make him our God too. Great evangelism came out of that experience. But Daniel had a prayer life before he went to the lion's den. He didn't wait till he got in the lion's den and said, boy, I better start praying. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were, they were obviously worshipers. And, and uh, when the king said, whenever you hear all the band play, you know, you need to bow down and, wash, and worship this golden idol. And when they didn't, and some of uh, the king's advisors found out about it, and they reported Shadrach and Meshach, and Meshach and Abednego, they were all governors, by the way. They were all rulers in the king's court. Um, and when the king found out that they weren't worshiping, they said, well, that's not who we're, we're not worshiping them. How can, you, how can you say I'm not worshiping anything false and really stand and say, I don't care if you throw me in the furnace and if we die here today, I'm not worshiping this false God. How can you say that unless you already have a worship life with the true and living God? So you can't. Because flesh is not capable of that. Flesh is not strong enough to do that. Flesh is weak. You think, well, I'll stand and I'll let him chop my head off for Jesus if it comes to it. Really? Not if you don't have sound fundamentals in your life. Story after story in the Bible, we see the people of God in situations, horrendous situations, and they get through them. And not only do they get through them and live, God always does something glorious there. Paul said in Ephesians 6, he says, put on the whole armor of God. We're not going to chase that whole thing, but, but the armor of God is just, it's full of all kinds of things that you protect your mind, and you protect your heart, man, and you're guarding your walk. It's, it, it's representing those fundamental things. And he said at the very end, the last piece of the armor, he said, and he said, and pray, man, he said, pray is the last piece of armor that people stop short at sometimes. And, and he's saying, man, get these fundamentals on, put your armor on, get your fundamentals online. And that's when he said, and we quote it all the time, but then when you've done all, you know to do. Just stand. What preceded just standing? Putting on the armor of God. Well, what if we don't put on the armor? What if we wait till we fall and we say, well, I better put on the armor of God. See, we're, we're, we're a very reactive church in America because we're a very reactive people in America. Have you noticed with every little thing that, that, that's on the news how we overreact anymore? We're very reactive. You know... Someone can sneeze on the other side of the world in the wrong direction and oil prices double. We react. Our biggest problem with oil in America now is a bunch of people that are called speculators. You know what speculators do? They speculate. That can be a dangerous thing. Unless you have maybe one of God's seers. They speculate, okay, now someone just ran a bulldozer into... A pickup truck over in Saudi Arabia, the pickup truck ran into a gas pump and 500 gallons of gas burned up over there. It's completely lost. And there's going to be some kind of trickle down reaction to that. And so now we need to take the, the gas up at the pumps in America up 10 cents tomorrow to counteract that. Speculators are people who are paid to react before anything ever happens. I know, it's, it's insane. That's what's going on in our country and around the world now. We've become a people who just goes about our life, the business of our life. We've got lots going on. There's more, there's more to life than just going to church. I, I'm saved. I believe in God. And I've got things to do. My kids are busy in this and I'm busy in that. We've got, 
recreation things, amusement things, and projects we're doing at the, at the house, and just the list goes on and on and on and on. And then when we face a giant, or we find ourselves in a cave, we find ourselves in a fiery furnace, we find ourselves in, in a lion's den, then suddenly we want to react and say, well, I, need to, I, I better go to church this Sunday. Because we're trying to react and counterbalance something that just happened. But in the first century church, it didn't work that way. The first century church practiced the basic, what we call foundations of our faith. They had a prayer life. They grabbed hold of the apostles' teaching every time they could get it. They worshipped. And they were busy fellowshipping together. The Bible said daily in each other's homes. Then when life struck, guess what they did? They just handled it. They just handled it. When something unusual happened, when something unexpected happened, they just handled it. Now let's you and I be honest with ourselves without beating ourselves up. It's very important that we can be real with ourselves in church without bringing condemnation on ourselves. I understand when you think I'm saying things to put condemnation on you, you're actually bringing condemnation on yourself. I'm trying to bring life to you. It's important that we be real. Let's look, at, let's look in the mirror for a while. Let's look at our own lives. To what degree are we reacting in life? Every little thing that happens. And Bertha broke her ankle and now I'm out of church for three weeks. People come to me all the time. It's like, well, you know, I'm sorry. I know I haven't seen you for the last three weeks. Well, no, I know. We've been worried about you. Are you okay? It's like, well, yeah. Uncle Bill, he had his tooth pulled and you know, just it got infected. And Okay, so did you go see Uncle Bill? Have you been there holding? He said, well, no, we, we didn't have time to go see him. Well, why in the crap did you just tell me that story then? <laughs> if we could hear ourselves, we'd be embarrassed. You wouldn't believe it. And the problem is, the only problem is, is because life is going to happen. And it ain't going to be Uncle Bill's toothache next time. Something's going to hit you in your home. You're going to come under attack at some point. You didn't necessarily have to do anything wrong for it to happen. If you don't believe me, just ask Joe. Now what are we going to do? Are we going to become reactive and go, oh my gosh, now I, I'm scrambling. I better start praying. Boy, I hope Pastor Scott gives an altar call this week on peace because I, I, I need peace so bad. Somehow in Jerusalem in the first century, they maintained their peace though they were being impaled in stakes. And by the end of that, of that generation, boy, Jesus nailed it. He said, unless you flee the city, he said, no one will be left. I know our great 20th century paperback theologians turned that passage into a someday, but it very much happened, as Jesus said, before that generation passed away. He said, if they don't flee Jerusalem, there won't be anyone left. I'm telling you, the persecution was so heavy in Jerusalem that if they wouldn't have left and scattered throughout the earth, there would not have been one single Christian left in that city. It was horrendous. But they scattered and they did what they had to do and they moved somewhere else and they set up camp and they continued on living and, and they just they took over the earth. They didn't run to the cave and scream for the rocks to fall on them. Woe is me, it's so terrible. How can people be that way? How can they be so strong in the, in the, in the first century and we be so soft 2,000 years later? Because they had the fundamentals down and we don't. I won't ask for a show of hands here today, but the statistics that are often reported, and I don't know who's taking up these reports and doing these reports. I don't know if they're through phone calls where no one's given names or what. I know I wouldn't give my name probably, but they're, they're always releasing these statistics where pastors can get their hands on them. The percentage of people in America, the average percentage that's tied in, the average percentage that, that has that how long they spend praying every day, how often they go to church every week. And, and I look at those stats, you know, uh, uh, right now we're down to, to a 12% of American Christians tithe, less than 12% admit to having a legitimate prayer life. The average family under 40 doesn't go to church more than half the time, even when they say, I'm part of that church, that's where I go and I'm involved there. They're not there half the time getting teaching. You, you, you know you don't want the statistics on Daily devotional Bible reading. You know you don't want that, right? By the way, you ain't going to see anything else new in that shortest psalm you keep reading every night before you go to bed to make yourself feel better. Ain't nothing else in there. You've peeled that onion as far as it's going to go, okay? 
Guys, I didn't come here to spank us. I came here as a coach today. A coach that looks out at the body of Christ, and especially here at Cornerstone Family Church, and says, man, we have got a pool of talent here. Lord, if you've ever been to any of our VBSs or anything we do where, where we tap into the creative nature of this house, man, you guys are just, you are some of the most resourced people I've ever seen. Man, this, this is a, I wrote a letter to some pastors the other day talking about how the, that I'm seeing such a, um, a testimony of Jesus Christ in, in this place. Because while other churches are out um, just raising money, raising money, raising money to buy all the things they need, we're not a church that has the money to buy all the things we need, so we have to create it. We have to come up with great ideas. And if someone else has got something we really wish we had that cost $5,000, we have to figure out how we can make one for $50. And the one we make for $50 almost always looks at least as good as the one that costs five grand. It's incredible what you can do when you tap into the image of God that's inside of you. Now look at the American church and look at how reactive we've become. And, and I look at how fragile we have become. We, we, are, we are so fragile. It just takes nothing to knock us off our horse. People come to me and say, man, my marriage is, is help me with my marriage. Well, what's going on in your marriage? It's your basic things that our grandparents could not relate to. Our grandparents would say, yeah, what you got? What else you got? What you got better than that? There were generations before us that understood covenant. And they heard themselves at the altar say, for better or for worse. Acknowledging there will be worse. In sickness and in health, acknowledging, I can't believe the, the hoopla dilemma that was going on in the last couple of weeks in the body of Christ. Because there was one spouse who had Alzheimer's and, and couldn't remember anything. And now there's all these the voices of God speaking to it saying, well, I think that they can legally be released. And blah. I would like to think that if I get Alzheimer's, which my wife has accused me of before, <laughs> I would love to think that if I come into a place where I don't know anybody, and I don't even remember that's my wife, that she's going to come and take care of me every single day like we're still on our honeymoon. She's going to pet me. She's going to lotion me. Man, she's going to say sweet somethings to me, and I may not remember it five minutes later, but it's not going to matter because with covenant, it doesn't matter. We're so soft in our marriages and, and, you know, we don't use the same kind of toothpaste. I don't know if I can live with this woman any longer. <laughs> Instead of finding some cutesiness in those weird, weird little things that we all do, say, oh, that's cute how you do that. No, we're annoyed by it. Now it's rattling our whole world and I don't know if I can stay in this marriage any longer. You guys figured out that in marriages, male and female is not on the same page. They do not see life the same way, so they fight. Because both of you are right, the other one is messed up. You're really just male and female the way God created you. So when you say, well, I can't live with that person because I'm like this and they're like that, then you're telling me that, then, uh, then you don't need to be married anymore. Uh, we, we struggle trying to parent we struggle with our jobs. We can't handle anything on our jobs. It doesn't take anything to stress us out and fill us with anxiety. We've become so soft. If we're going to get miracles, then we've got to preach about them. Did you guys understand? Do you, do you get it that when you preach a sermon on miracles, it does not make miracles happen? Preaching sermons on healing does not cause healings to happen. Let me tell you what causes healings in the supernatural to flow. People that are walking in the foundations of Jesus Christ. They have a prayer line. They, they are in sync with the Word of God. They are in fellowship with God's people and allowing iron to sharpen iron. They have a worship life where they're soaking in the presence of God. And now wherever they walk, there is the potential for a miracle every time they stretch their hand out and touch something. Because the anointing has been released through their prayer life and through, and through being in the Word and adhering to, to the apostles' teachings and, and fellowship and, and worship. 
It's, it's, it's loading them down with stuff. It's putting seed in them and it's nurturing seed and there's a harvest growing in and now they're just, they're ready to release harvest wherever it's, wherever it's needed. And now instead of spending their life with life maintenance trying to just hold on, they're not even thinking about their lives anymore. Was that not supposed to be the great prophetic decree over the body of Christ? They would not even care about their lives anymore. They overcame. John, how did they overcome? They overcame by the blood of the Lamb. And the word of their testimony and they did not even love their lives enough to try to hold on to their life. Why? Because Jesus said, if you try to find your life, hold on to your life, what will happen to your life? You'll lose your life. Our whole church experience in America is revolving around one thing right now. Teaching people how to hold on to their lives. Life maintenance. Life maintenance. It's on TV. Some of the biggest churches in America today, their sermons revolve around life maintenance, life maintenance, life maintenance. I'm telling you, 90% of what we're preaching... To get the results we hope to get, we don't have to preach. We've got to get back to learning how to tackle, learning how to block, learning how to protect the ball. We've got to get back to the fundamentals. We're coming and we're wanting someone to lay hands on us and change our life. And people are coming to me and they're broken. And I'll set them down and go, come on, I want to help you. I want to help you. I want to help you get your life back on track. Let's talk about some things first. They're wanting to talk about the problem. I'm trying to find where the problem started at. And say, like, well, if, if, if God would just do that, I hear like, well, if God would just do this. Or if this person would just, if my husband would just do this. And then I, I pull it back and everyone gets mad and say, come on, forget that for a second. Where are you at with God right now? Tell me about your prayer life. Well, I don't really have a prayer life. Hey, what's been going on with you in the Word? What, what have you been studying lately? Well, I'm, I'm not really in the Word. Okay, I've noticed you're not at church real often either. But somehow we're wanting a magic act up here. We're wanting people to pull out magic wands. Well, if I can just go see Benny Hinn, I know I'll get healed. Really? Well, maybe you can get healed and be as excited as a lot of other people I see walk across the stage who see him for the first time and they're remotely calm about it. I mean, just incredibly calm. Guys, I'm not saying miracles aren't happening out there in Sunday, but I'm telling you, in the Bible, people were getting miracles and they were leaping and dancing and praising God. They could not contain themselves. I hear testimonies of miracles and I don't see that kind of reaction. I'm wondering, did a miracle just really happen right there? Because I'm thinking if I'm hearing for the first time, it's going to get crazy in here real fast. If I'm getting up and walking for the first time, Son, open that door, open the door at the front, get ready, because here I come. What's happening, guys? We've built a pseudo-church that is falling way short of the glory, the reputation of God. And I'm telling you, 28 years into this thing, hardcore ministry, I'm telling you, take it from me and Coach Wooden, we got one big problem. We ain't got no fundamentals for the game. We got no prayer life. We ain't in the Word. We ain't in fellowship and we don't worship. So we got no anointing. And we got no power. I don't want to be using my power to keep my life managed. I want to use my power out there. I don't want to use every resource of God just trying to keep me maintained and holding on. Man, I don't even want to worry about me. Got to get our ducks in a row, guys. Got to get them in a row. Have you guys ever watched Karate Kid? At least the first one. Started going downhill right after that. Confirmation they need to stop doing sequels. Classic movie. Classic, classic movie. One of the most important movies ever made. Can I give you the catchphrase for the whole movie? Wax on, wax off. Well, what has this got to do with karate? Don't paint the fence, grasshopper. <laughs> and he's out there, it's like, mm -hmm. it's like no, grasshopper. It's all in wrist and the sun. <laughs> What's that got to do with him? Then he's out there and he's standing on the post. And the old bird, right? You all know that's, that's what he wants his tournament with, right? You know that. You know. I used to kick a little higher, but I don't want to be in traction the rest of the week. 
Hey, you didn't hear this. Well, because the, the, the child would say, well, what does waxing the car have to do with karate? What does painting the fence have to do with karate? But then you notice when he was in the tournament, whatever his opponents would throw at him became automatic response. The fundamentals is what brings automatic response, proper response into life. If I have a prayer life and I'm in a situation that, that, that needs a lot of prayer now, now I'm not freaking out and I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not in some kind of defensive posture. No, I have a prayer life. I have a connection with God and I'm bold and I'm strong and I'm going to start speaking to things and I'm going to declare some things. And I'm going to have the mind of God and I'm going to take care of that thing and I'm going to move on to the next order of business in life. And I'm not going to get trapped in that thing. Because if, because if I, if I, if I apply a prayer life and, and being in the Word and being in church and being in fellowship and being a worshiper, if I apply those things to my understanding the same way that Mr. Miyagi was trying to help young Daniel's son understand, wax on, wax off, then you're going to find that your whole world is going to more radically change over this one little simple thing than anything else. So here's our problem. All the thugs in sports today, they don't care about fundamentals. Basketball players just want to see who can jump the highest. Have you noticed, how many of you guys watch the NBA dunk um, competitions? Have you noticed the guys who jump the highest and do the fanciest dunks are not the stars in the NBA? Have you noticed that? Since the Michael Jordan, Dominique Wilkins day, there's been no superstars really doing the dunk competitions. The guys that can jump and do all those fancy dunks and do all the fancy magic wand stuff, they have no fundamentals. And so when they're actually out in the game, they don't really, they don't do anything. They don't score. They, they don't really matter if they're on their team or not. They flash, they got the bling, um, they, they, man, they got all the moves, you know, everyone's got the moves now, man. Football players, man, everyone's like, I run a 4.1, 4.1, 4.1. Coaches will say, I don't care if they run a 2.1. If they don't know how to protect the ball, I can't use them. Some of the fastest guys in college football never get to carry the football for one reason. They've never learned the, the fundamentals of holding on to the ball. Guys gotta get the fundamentals down. If we will, if we will stop all this nonsense that we're doing in the American church, where we're, we're, we're revolving our whole church life around um, trying to preach things and, and, and have altar calls around things, things we're trying to get right there in that second, get back to the fundamentals of life, I'm telling you, we're gonna have the same response they had in the first century church. By the way, that is our promise. It's gonna happen. The question is, will we be a part of it? They weren't worried about their lives, and so they had incredible evangelism. Incredible signs and wonders and miracles. And the city was filled with joy. And everybody was amazed and awestruck at what all God was doing in the church. That's what I want. How do we do it? Well, in the words of a great Christian singing group, we need to get back to the basics of life. When he knows that song. I should have brought that and let you play that back right there. Back to the basics. Back to the basics. How many of you guys believe what I'm telling you is true today? How many of you would say, and I know I need to get back to these fundamentals in my life? I know it. When I shrink back, I struggle. I think it's your fault. I think it's her fault. I think it's Hannah's fault. I think it's God's fault. I struggle when I start shrinking back from the fundamentals. But when I am zoned in on the fundamentals, I want you to know my life is strong and confident. And man, I just blaze through life. We know this, but now we have to make sure we do this. Why don't you stand with me?